Star Walker Studios presents Dungeon Master's Journey, your multidimensional D&D podcast. Hello, fellow gamer. Welcome to episode 283 of Dungeon Master's Journey. I'm your host, Lex Starwalker. On this show, we discuss the craft and the art of dungeon mastering. I've been running RPGs for over 29 years now, and I produce this show in the hopes that you can benefit from my experience, my triumphs, and my mistakes. So today, in addition to being the 283rd episode of the show, this is also the finale episode of season 14. So, wow, um, another year has has gone by <laughs> um, for Dungeon Master's Journey. So, yeah, thanks for thanks for coming along. So today, what we're going to talk about is I'm going to revisit my discussion of degrees of failure, success at a cost, and player agency. I'm also going to talk about some of my favorite aspects from some fifth edition settings and a non D&D setting uh, that I might use in my own setting of Primordia or that you might want to use in in your own homebrew setting. But before I get into all of that, I want to talk about season 15, the, the next season of the show, and also the future of the show. So um, I have to confess that as I've gone back and, and listened to some of the, the more recent episodes that I've, I've been really unhappy with the last few episodes that I put out. And in general, I've been less and less happy with the episodes I've been putting out for the last, I don't know, year or so. Um, it, it's been harder and harder for me to find the time to produce a show and so it, as part of that, in in trying to still put episodes out and get content out for you guys, um, I've been doing a lot less editing of the shows than I used to do when I produce it, um, a lot less uh, planning of the episodes, a lot, well, a lot less time spent planning, I should stay, say. I still plan the episodes, but I just don't put the time into it that I used to, and um, up to the point that the last few episodes, I, I've done hardly any editing at all, which for those of you that have been with me for a long time, you can probably tell, you can probably tell, um, that there's been less editing in, in recent episodes. Um, so I feel like all of this has resulted in the show getting more rambling, um, my repeating myself more and and just, um, taking too long to make points that shouldn't take that long to make. Um, and I think it's resulted in the episodes being longer, uh, without necessarily having more quality content in them. So, you know, when I first started the show over five years ago, I, I was shooting for hour long episodes and, and that's always been kind of the goal um, but the most recent episodes I, I've put out have, have all been well over an hour and, and the last one was over two hours. And when I went back and went through it again, um, I felt like that at the very least I could have gotten that episode down to an hour and a half with, with some editing, more editing and, and probably with better planning of the episode and, and still more editing could probably have gotten it pretty close to an hour. So I hate to waste your time. Um, I'd much rather the show be concise and, and get to the point. Um, so I, I haven't um, been super satisfied with uh, the, the quality of the show, at least how I feel about it. Um, I used to edit the episodes a lot more. I used to pre-write or even sometimes script the episodes or parts of the episodes. And I just think the show was better when I did those things, but it took a lot more time. I spent a lot more time working on the episodes back in those days than, than I have been recently. And lately it, it's been all I've been able to do to find the time to get the show out at all. Um, the way I've been doing it, which is little to no editing. 
Now, now there are definitely podcasters out there that can make great podcasts with no editing. I just don't feel like I'm one of them. Um, so more and more, I, I have other responsibilities in my life that are demanding my time. Um, and, and that's really what this comes down to at the end of the day. It, it's all about time, finite time and, and how I spend my time. Um, and I've come to the point where I feel like I'd be better off quote quitting while I'm ahead. Um, and just stop doing the show and, and leave the show with mostly good episodes in the feed that I'm proud of, um, then to continue to fill the feed with episodes that I'm not putting the time into that I should, that are kind of lackluster and, and don't hold up to the older, older episodes as far as quality and, and just, um, you know, I'd rather go out with a bang than a whimper, you know? Um, and, and, I, I get so many comments from people who say this is their favorite podcast or it's the best D and D podcast out there. And I, I get that a lot. Um, and I don't want to ruin that by, by putting out subpar content here at, at the end. Um, I'd rather quit while I'm ahead, leave everybody with a good impression and, and, you know, leave the stage with some grace <laughs> as it were. However, on the other hand, I've been doing this show for five and a half years now, and I'd, I'd love to keep it going, and I'd love to get back to the level of quality that I used to have. I'd love to be able to do that. Um, I'm definitely open to spending more time on the show and, and going back to the way I used to do things and, and putting a lot more into it if I can find the time to do it. So I've, I've thought about this a lot, and I've talked with, it, with my wife Nikki a lot. And I think I've come up with a plan that will work, that will make me happy and will make you happy and will make everybody happy, I hope. And um, I'm especially excited about this idea and, and happy with this idea because I'm, I'm really um, going to put it in your hands, the, the listeners of the show, uh, which is where it should really be. Um, I, I make the show, I produce the show, but in a lot of ways, it's your show. I make it for you, not so much for me. Um, so this might, this episode 283 might be the last episode of Dungeon Master's Journey. This is the finale episode for season 14. It might be the finale episode for, for the whole show. So it is going to be a longer episode. Um, because I mean, there's lots of things I want to talk about. I'm not going to talk about them all today. Um, but, but since this might be the last episode of the show, I, I wanted to do as much as I could. So it, it's going to be a marathon episode. So strap in, um, you don't have to listen to it all at once. Feel free to pause, take a break, come back to it, you know, tomorrow or whatever. So this might be the last episode of the show, or it might just be the last episode of season 14 and I'll be coming back with new episodes, new season 15. Um, so as I said, all of this, it, it really all comes down to time or lack of time. And so here's the plan. I am going to, uh, after this episode, I'm going to make Dungeon Master's Journey a subscription based podcast. So the 283 episodes, including this one that I've produced thus far, um, will continue be to, to be free and you can continue to get those however you usually do with your app or however you've been listening to the show. As far as the old episodes, the episodes up to this point, you can still do it the same way. Um, nothing's changing as far as that. The only thing that's changing is the future. So for season 15 and beyond, um, the new Dungeon Master's Journey episodes will be available to subscribers for $2 a month. So I am going to handle this as far as the billing aspect of it through my Patreon page that I've had going for years. And some of you are already patrons. So you can sign up on my Patreon for $2 a month or more, and you will get the new episodes and continue to get new episodes. So right now the plan is is that I'm going to take August off. So this episode should be out towards the end of July. 
Um, the plan is I'm going to take August off just to give people time to sign up. Um, I figured out kind of where I need to be as far as what the show needs to be making for me to be able to take the time that I want to take to do it. I'm going to set that up on Patreon as milestones so that when you become a patron, you can kind of see where we're at, how close we're getting to that goal. Um, so if we can do this, then that will enable me to carve out the time, the extra time to make the show happen and to make it better. And yeah, we'll just see how it goes. Now, what I would really like to see is that we get enough patrons or, or enough support that I can put out four episodes a month. That's, that's what I, that's my goal. That's what I want to do. I want to put out four episodes a month, every month. Um, some months there are five episodes. So those months, they'll just be a week without an episode, just to keep things simple. It'll be four episodes every month. Um, but I realize we might not get there right away. I, I realize there are almost 300 episodes in the feed and a lot of people, when they start listening, they, they want to go back to the very beginning and, and listen in order. So I know any new listeners might be back in episode 100 and something. So it might take a couple months for everybody to get caught up and, and get to, to where we're at now and know what's going on and be able to sign up. So um, the plan is to take August off and if we get enough people to sign up to start season 15 in September. Um, and, and like I said, I set a goal for four episodes a month. However, um, just to give us some more wiggle room, because I know it, it might take a while for the word to get out and for people to catch up. Um, I also set a goal for two episodes a month and one episode a month. Now, I don't want to do one or two episodes a month for very long, um, you know, but for the first few months, I'm willing to do that just to give people more time to get signed up um, before I decide that there's not enough support and I'm going to end the show. So if you go to the Patreon page, uh, you'll see three new milestone goals. There'll be one for one episode a month one for two episodes a month, and then one for four episodes a month. And you'll get to see the little progress bars to see how close we are to getting there. Um, if we hit one of those goals by September 1st, then I'll start production on season 15 and I'll start releasing new episodes. If we hit the four episode goal before September 1st, if we hit it sometime in August, I'll, I'll start putting stuff out in August. Um, the only reason I'm waiting till September is just to give people some time. Um, but you know, if we get enough people signed up in, you know, the first half of August, then, then I'll start in August if I can. Um, okay. So it's $2 a month. Of course, you're welcome to pledge more than $2 a month. If you've never used Patreon, uh, it's a monthly thing and, and you can, uh, pledge any amount that you want. You don't have to do $2. You can do any amount that you want to do. Um, so you're welcome to do more than $2. And I encourage you to do so if you can, because I set the goal at a dollar amount, not at a number of patrons amount. So, um, you know, every bit above $2 that, that you pledge gets us closer to that goal. I'm also working on, I want to have some additional awards for those who do pledge more than 200 two dollars two hundred dollars oh my god um for those that pledge more than two dollars um so if you have ideas or suggestions for rewards you'd like or you think would be cool for that um let me know um definitely need some ideas for that and um patreon does their billing on the first of the month so the way i'm going to do it is the pledges for a given month will determine the fate of the show for the next month so if we get enough pledges in August, I'll put out episodes in September. If we get enough in September, I'll put out episodes in October and so on. So not only will monetizing the show in this way allow me to be able to devote more time into producing it, it's also going to, for the first time ever, give me a concrete real number of how many dedicated listeners I actually have so that I know that it's worth the time and the effort that I'm putting into this. As things are right now, I can track downloads, how many downloads each episode gets. 
but that doesn't really actually tell me a whole lot. I, I really have no way of knowing how many people actually listen to the show every episode. I, I have no way to know because you can have people that will download an episode numerous times. You can have people who are subscribed on some app and it just automatically downloads episodes and they never listen to them or they only listen to someone, some of them, or they listen to a few minutes and they shut it off. And there's no way for me to know any of that. I think there are even some bots and things out there that'll download episodes. I, I don't know, but, but so the download number, it, it gives you a ballpark idea of if more people are downloading this month than last month. But as far as how many actual listeners you have, what your audience size is, it really doesn't give you that. This will also allow me to continue producing the show without filling the episodes with annoying advertisements like so many other podcasts do. Um, oh, I can't stand that personally. Um, having to sit through minutes and minutes and minutes of advertisements. Um, and I don't do that and, and I'm not going to do that. Um, this is, this is a better way. I think it, it's a way to keep the show going without cannibalizing the show itself and ruining the show <laughs> in the process. So at the end of the day, um, the reality is, I think that the endless production of free quality podcasts is not sustainable. Um, you know, people who make good quality podcasts put a lot of time into it. They put a lot of work into it. They put a lot of money into it. You need software, you need a website, yada, yada, yada. Um, so for people to continue to do that long-term, um, for free, it, it's just, it's not sustainable sustainable. Sure. There are people that can do that and will do that, but in the long term, overall, it, it's not sustainable. And I'm, I'm sure you can probably see that. So, so I predict probably not too far in the future, um, that most podcasts will either be, be paid and monetized in some way or podcasting will just disappear. Um, that's just the reality and, and you see it happening already. So I've had so many people tell me that this is a high quality podcast. And I've even had a lot of people tell me it's the best D&D podcast out there. I tend to agree. So if that is true, then I think it should be easily worth more than $2 a month to get the podcast. If I do four episodes a month, that's 50 cents an episode, um, which frankly is almost insultingly cheap. <laughs> if the show is half as good as people tell me it is. But that's the number I've settled on, not because I think that's what the show is worth, um, far from it, but because I think that's what people might possibly actually pay. Um, unfortunately, there's just no perception of value in podcasts right now, mainly because so many people are doing it for free. And it's hard to get people to pay for something they can get for free. Um, so if you can afford more than $2 and if the show is worth more than $2 a month to you, then please give accordingly. Um, again, if you're unfamiliar with Patreon, um, you can go check out their site. Um, but you can, in addition to setting any amount you want to give every month that you want, you can cancel at any time. There's no penalties or fees for canceling. Um, there's no BS. It's it's pretty straightforward. And I've been using Patreon for years um, and I've never had any problems with them. I've never heard from a listener that's had any problems with them. And at this point, I mean, it, Patreon's a pretty well-known thing. Um, so yeah, there's nothing to worry about there as far as that. So as part of all of this, I'm going to be retiring our community on MeWe um, honestly, there's never really been a whole lot of activity on there, especially lately. There's been little to no activity. And I really don't like how our community has become so spread out uh, since the demise of Google+. Plus. You know, we've got some people on MeWe. We've got some people on Discord. Um, you know, other people aren't on any community. So the MeWe community is going to be replaced by our Patreon page. Because we can pretty much do everything that, that we do on MeWe on Patreon. And since uh, going forward, anyone listening to the show, at least currently listening to the current episodes, will be a patron, 
it just seems logical to have that be our community hub. Um, however, I'm, I'm considering possibly keeping the Discord server going, um, but I haven't decided on that. So if you have an opinion on whether or not to keep the Discord server going, uh, let me know. But but again, everybody's going to be on Patreon anyway. So, um, and you're going to be going to Patreon. It, well, you may not necessarily be going to Patreon to get the episodes because you can subscribe to the feed. Um, but you'll at least be going there to subscribe to the feed and, and to manage your patronage. So, um, yeah, we're, we're going to get rid of me, we, and, and we'll just have the, the Patreon and, and maybe discord depending on, on what I decide to do with that. Um, the show notes for the episodes will still be published on my website at starwalkerstudios.com, but the audio files will be hosted by Patreon and, and you'll get th- those from Patreon. Um, because you'll have to subscribe to get the new episodes. If you use a podcast app of some kind, um, all you're going to have to do once you become a patron, you will get your own private RSS feed link for the show, and you'll just want to subscribe using that link in your app, and then you'll be good to go. Also, all the old episodes of the show are in the Patreon feed already. So when you subscribe with the new link, um, you'll have access to, to all the episodes. So I've, I've already started planning on season 15. And just so you know, I'm not planning to do any more actual play as part of the podcast. Um, I might still occasionally do some campaign recaps if there's interest in that. Um, I plan to do more world building episodes and of course we'll continue to explore topics of dungeon mastering and storytelling in the show. And another cool thing about this is I imagine, um, our audience may get a little smaller, but you all will be on Patreon and I don't know, I'm just hoping that there'll be more interaction and even though I may have smaller listeners, those listeners that I have will, I will hear from more often. And hopefully we can have more of a back and forth where more, we have more of you all suggesting topics and, and presenting questions. So, so the topics of the show can be even more targeted toward what you want, um, which I think would be awesome. So, so I really hope that that's a, a part of this, one of the consequences of this. So I imagine I'll lose some listeners over this. Hopefully not too many. But my hope is that enough of you will stay with me to make this work. Um, The upside, like I said, I think we'll have a tighter community now. Um, There may be fewer listeners, but the listeners will be able to better uh, interact with one another and with myself in a more tightly knit community all in one place on the Patreon community and, and possibly Discord. Um, and if you ask a question, it will be far more likely that it's answered on the show because there will be less people asking questions, theoretically. Um, and, you know, I'm sure if if this blows up and, and I have way more people sign up for this than I think, um, and it's too much to handle, um, then, then we can use the patron rewards to kind of decide, um, you know, higher, higher tier patrons can get questions answered first kind of thing. Um, but I'm still working out the, the higher tier rewards on the Patreon, but, but that could be one, one possible, uh, reward for that. If, if that's needed, as far as the discord server, um, I believe that the, there's a way that I can um, make the discord server a subscription thing too. And, and that will be part of the deciding factor. If I keep the discord or not, then the main thing will be how many people want me to keep the discord because it's pointless to have it if people aren't using it. Um, but I believe I can set up the discord in such a way that only patrons will have access to it because what I don't want to do is I don't want to have a community for people who aren't patrons because part of this is everybody is supposed to be (laughs) subscribed to the show. Um, so it'd be kind of counterproductive for me to have a community for people that aren't subscribed. Um, so if there is a discord, it's not going to be for quote free listeners or whatever that would be. It, It will be part of the benefit of being a subscriber. We'll be getting 
access to that server, but I haven't even looked into that, but I, I know that there's a way to do it because I've seen private discord servers before. I just don't, I haven't looked into that yet. So, so that's still something I'm exploring. So I'm sorry if I lose anyone over this. I really am. But honestly, at this point, it's either this or I just end the show completely. So this might be the last episode, depending on if, if people subscribe or not. I hope it's not, but it, but it might be. It's, it's really up to you. It's in your hands, which honestly is, is where it should be, I think. So I really hope I don't piss anyone off over this. Um, if you are pissed about it, uh, maybe you can ask yourself how much you really value this show and the other podcasts you listen to. And how does that compare to how you value other forms of entertainment you may enjoy, like books, magazines, movies, TV shows, um, D&D and other RPGs themselves? All of these forms of entertainment that we all enjoy and that we all pay for. None of these things are free. Um, podcasting is the only one that's free. Um, also think about other podcasts you listen to that are stuffed full of annoying ads or lengthy discussions of their Patreon every single episode. Um, which yeah, this has been a lengthy discussion, but this is one episode. I don't do this every episode. So isn't it worth $2 a month not to have to deal with all that bullshit? I feel like it is. Over the years, I've heard from a lot of listeners who say they really value the show. And I think if that's true, and I think it is true, then we shouldn't have any problem hitting our goal. And I'll be able to continue bringing you this show four times a month. And if not, if we don't get there, there's no hard feelings. Um, I've had a great time doing this. It's been a lot of fun. And, you know, all good things come to an end eventually whether that's a D&D campaign or a podcast. So I thank you for listening. I thank you for your time and for coming with me on my Dungeon Master's journey. So you can find the link to my Patreon page in the show notes for this or any of the episodes over at starwalkerseos.com or you can go directly to the page at patreon.com slash starwalkerstudios. So again, apologies for all of that. I thank you for your indulgence. And now we will continue on to talk about some D&D. All right. So last week in episode 282, listener DM Nick wrote in and asked about going beyond simple pass fail in D&D. And I was so embarrassed, and I'm surprised I haven't heard from anyone about this, when I listened to the episode again, and I realized that I got distracted in explaining the different ways you can do success at a cost and degrees of failure in the system in D&D and pointing out that there are actually rules about that because they are optional rules in the DMG. And I thought Nick and some other people might not even know those were there. Um, but I got so caught up in that that I never actually answered Nick's actual question, which wasn't about that. Um, his question was basically, how do you do it in a satisfying way? Not what are the mechanics, but how do you actually do it? How do you actually make it satisfying for the players? Um, specifically, how do we handle when a PC fails at an important role or succeeds with a cost? And how do we do that in a satisfying way? So I realized what I did was I answered the easy question that anybody could have answered and I ignored or forgot about the hard question. Um, so I'm going to try to answer the hard question now and, and apologies to Nick for making you wait another week to actually get the answer to your question. Hopefully you, you didn't uh, unsubscribe and disgust and, and hopefully you hear this, Nick. <laughs> so it's not an easy question to answer, which, which is maybe why I forgot to answer it. I, I don't know. Um, so for a more in-depth exploration of this topic, I talked about this kind of thing a lot back in the GM intrusion days as the game Numenera and, and all cipher system games, I think have a mechanic called the GM intrusion that the podcast was named after, which is very similar to using a success with cost or a degree of failure kind of thing. 
So in Numenera and other Cypher System games, a GM intrusion happens when you roll a natural one on the D20. And the GM intrusion is a complication that the GM adds to the game. It doesn't have to mean that the thing the player was rolling to do fails. Rather, the GM intrusion means that something interesting happens, likely making the PC's life more difficult, um, or at least more interesting. But it, but it's a complication. So if you go look through the episodes of GM Intrusions um, and look for ap- episodes on the GM Intrusion mechanic, uh, you'll find lots of discussion that, that's directly relevant to this topic um, and, and way more than I could do in a single episode of, of any show. So I encourage you to do that. Go check those out. So for me personally, as far as how I approach this, Um, When I'm going to throw a complication in the game, uh, whether that's due to a GM intrusion or a player rolls a one or they fail a check by five or more, which is how the degrees of failure system works in 5e, um, or it's a success with complications, um, my my first focus when I'm trying to decide what is this wrench I'm going to throw into players' gears My first focus is on fun and making the game more interesting. So in my mind, the purpose of something like this isn't to punish the player or even their character, although there often are negative consequences. So, you know, you can be forgiven for thinking that that's the purpose. But I, at least to me, in my opinion, the real purpose isn't to punish them. Um, That's kind of, I mean, it, it, it often does punish them, but the, but the real purpose is to make the game more fun, to make things more unpredictable and or more interesting. So, you know, maybe the encounter or the scene or whatever it was, well, was kind of going a certain way. It's on a certain trajectory and a player rolls a one or they succeed with a complication or something like that. And now you're going to introduce a twist or throw a wrench in the gears or introduce a complication that's going to take things in a different direction than where everyone was assuming they were going up to this point. And, and this is oftentimes in a story where things really start to get interesting. And, and if you're talking about a story you're reading or watching, that's where the, the audience kind of gets, gets pulled in and, and really um, gets hooked by the story. So my first step in in trying to come up with something like this, whether I'm doing it on the fly during play or if I'm doing it while I'm planning for a session, is to see if there's anything that just immediately comes to my mind that seems like it would be cool or fun or interesting or surprising or funny, um, something like that. We want to ideally use this as an opportunity to deepen the game and increase the buy-in and immersion that the players have for the game, including the player that this is happening to. It's not just the thing of the other players uh, enjoy it, but but ideally, even the, the player that's on the receiving end of this complication has fun with it too. Think of all the countless ways that things could go sideways in whatever situation you're in in your game. Um, think of Murphy's law, right? Everything that can go wrong will go wrong. What, what are all the ways that things could go wrong right now? And, and which of those ways seems the most interesting or fun or funny or tense or unpredicted, surprising, that kind of thing. So, you know, the, these kinds of things really work best with examples. I tried to think of some examples uh, that would be pretty um, universal that that you'll probably run into, um, and and tried to really give some thought to to how I might handle this to give you some ideas. And and of course, um, I'm not an expert on this. Um, I'm not the best person at doing this kind of thing by by any means. So if you're listening to this and you think my ideas are lame because they probably are, and you have better ideas, please let me know. And uh, <laughs> if there is a future episode of the show. Um, I could I could share um, some of the better ideas that, that you all send me for for twists on these scenarios or, or complications. 
So first off, let's take an example of a thief trying to pick the lock on a broken door. Um, maybe it's a horrible failure, right? Or maybe it's a success with a cost. But either way, you as the GM or the DM, you're looking for a way to make things more interesting than just you open the door or you don't, right? So what are the hilarious and or interesting ways that things could go wrong or get more complicated in this scenario? Oh, just as a quick aside, I feel like I should mention this. This episode is more pre-written and scripted. So if you compare this episode with the last episode, you might see some of what I'm talking about, about um, putting more time into the show. Now, I didn't put as much time in, in this episode as I used to back in the day. Um, so it's not a perfect proof of concept. For that, maybe go back and listen to one of the really early episodes. But uh, definitely spent much more time on this episode than I have recently. So if this sounds better to you, that this is the kind of thing I'm talking about. But anyway, back to our example. Um, thief's trying to pick open a lock on a door. So here are some things I came up with for ways you could complicate this. Um, the lock or the thief's tools that the thief is using, either one or both, could break. Um, making trying again impossible if the PC failed. So, so if they if they failed to to pick the lock and maybe they they failed really badly or whatever, um, and you decide to use a complication, the the fact that the lock breaks or their tools break or both means that they can't try to to pick the lock again because either the lock's broken or their tools are broken. Um, so that could be a consequence of it. Another possible consequence could be that this also could alert any people that are on the other side of the door from the sound of the breaking tool or the lock. They could hear that if the PC succeeds. So the first was, was if they failed the role and for some reason got a complication, this is if they, if they maybe a success with cost scenario, you could say, well, you open the lock, but in the process you break it or you break your tool. And that makes a loud sound that the people on the other side of the door hear. So they, they know you're coming now. Also, if the tool broke, the PC will also have to replace that tool before she can pick a similar lock again. So that could be a further uh, consequence that, that would be ongoing. Um, could be a big deal if they're far from anywhere where the PC could buy new thieves tools or, or find new thieves tools. Could, could be, um, that could be a complication for a while. Okay, so that's, that's one thing that could go wrong. Um, another thing that could go wrong is maybe there's a trap on the door, the lock or nearby that the thief failed to notice. And the complication is, is the thief triggered the trap. So that's pretty straightforward. Another way this could go wrong is the PC could open the door at the worst possible time. Like maybe when a bad guy just happens to be walking right by the door or someone in the room that the door leads to just happens to be looking right at the door when the PC opens it. Um, I think that'd be a great one because that's something that could easily happen. And it's just like, that's the Murphy's law thing right there. Right. It's like, what are the odds that someone in the room would just happen to be looking right at the door when you did this? Like there, it seems like the odds would be pretty low. Right. But that's, that's exactly what this is, is something really unexpected happening that makes things more difficult or more interesting, or both. Um, so something else could go wrong. Maybe there's some kind of surveillance on the door. Um, if you're playing like a fancy game, it could be magical surveillance or um, technological surveillance in a different kind of game. Um, but there's some kind of surveillance on the door, and the PC's inept picking of the lock alerts whomever or whatever is monitoring the door remotely. Um Another thing that could go wrong, if time is an issue for some reason, opening the lock could take a lot longer than it normally would, causing other complications in the adventure. So if they're on some kind of a time crunch, um, the fact that it takes the rogue, you know, 15 minutes to get through this lock could could be bad. So et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so those are just a few ideas um, with that. So... Hopefully you see that each of those 
is not shutting the player down or shutting the character down. They can still continue on, um, but it does make things more challenging or at least more interesting or more complicated, which is what we're going for. And, and again, the, the idea here is we do not want to bring things to a grinding halt. That's not what we're going for here. We don't want to try to present a no win or worst case scenario. Instead, we want to try to introduce a new problem or obstacle for the PCs to overcome or just make what they have to do next more challenging to accomplish, like entering this room and dealing with whatever is in the room. So let's take another example. Um, let's take an example of someone trying to persuade or intimidate an NPC to do what they want. So the PC is trying to persuade or intimidate an NPC to do what they want. The PC maybe either fails the role badly or succeeds with a cost. What are some possible complications we could use in this kind of scenario? So the first possibility, uh, the PC fails at intimidating or persuading the person, but the PC thinks he succeeded. This has definitely happened to me, I think. Um, so the NPC isn't fooled or convinced, but instead plays along and pretends that they are. This should be done with a purpose. So it really only works with an NPC that you know well, and you know the motivations for. Um, so you have an idea of why the NPC would go this route, why the NPC would play along and pretend to be persuaded or intimidated by the player character. You know, what's the NPC's end game here? What's their strategy? So, so this really only works if you have an NPC like that, that, that you could know that, um, that's fairly well developed. Um, you know, maybe, maybe the goal for the NPC is to manipulate the PC in some way or, or use this against them in the future in some way. Um, but I think that'd be a fun one. If you ever have that come up in, in a situation where you could use it, um, where the PC fails, uh, to, convince or persuade or intimidate an NPC is, is for the NPC to actually act like they were persuaded, but they're really not. I think you could have some fun with that. Another way this could go down is the PC succeeds at persuading or intimidating, but offends the NPC in the process. This, this is also an easy one to see in real life all the time. Um, so the PC convinces the NPC to do what she wants him to do, but she's a bit heavy handed doing it. So the NPC is resentful of the PC and he'll take the first opportunity he gets to get some payback. So that's another way you could do it. Um, another way this could go wrong is the PC succeeds, but maybe succeeds a little too well. And this very success leads to a complication somehow. Maybe the PCs are planning a heist and as part of the plan, they want, to install one of the player characters as a guard on one of the building entrances. So the player character convinces the owner of the building that his security isn't good enough and volunteers to help guard the door to improve security. However, the PC is so convincing about the subpar security that the NPC owner of the building also increases security around all the other entrances as well, making the planned heist that much harder to pull off. Another way this kind of thing could go wrong is let's say the PC is a suspect in a murder investigation and convinces the official that she's not guilty, but in the process, she accidentally gets the official thinking one of the other PCs did it. So yeah, there's, there's a few ideas. Um, I'm sure you could come up with more ideas, better ideas on, on how um, trying to persuade or intimidate someone could, could go wrong or, or, could go in a way that you don't expect or a way that that wasn't quite the outcome you were look, looking for or not in the way you were looking for it. So in the case of success with a cost, I would look for a twist, something unexpected, but that makes sense and seems obvious in hindsight that will complicate things and make things more interesting, presenting problems to solve, obstacles to overcome. In the case of a high degree of failure or a really bad failure, I'd look to raise the stakes to make the consequences of failure even worse than what the players already thought they were. 
perhaps by bringing in a new element or player in the situation that the players were previously unaware of. The nice thing about this approach is there's a bit of a silver lining as now at least the players have more information because they now know of this new player or element they didn't know about before. So maybe the PCs steal a good bit of treasure from a noble in the area. However, there's a massive failure at the end and the PCs find out that the treasure is actually owned by an ancient powerful dragon and the noble was just guarding it. Worse, the failure, whatever it was, got the dragon's attention, and it's coming after the PCs, not only to get its treasure back, but to punish their audacity in stealing it in the first place. So I hope that helps. I hope some of those ideas kind of kind of helped you um, generate your own ideas for this kind of thing. Um, but But for me, the bottom line is that I'm not so much focused on what's the worst thing I could do um, or what's the worst way I could punish the players. Rather, I'm looking for what's the most entertaining thing I can do. I'm wanting to use this as an opportunity to add layers to the story and increase player buy-in and get them on the edge of their seats. Like that's the, that's the goal that, that would be, um, that'd be great if I could do all those things. So I looked at I, I looked to make the situation more tense, more uncertain, or at the very least, more humorous. I also today wanted to revisit a little bit my discussion of player agency. Uh, I think that was a couple episodes ago now. I think I came off a little too strong in how I phrased some of that. And and I I listening to it later, I could see how someone could come away from that with a very different um, sense of what I was trying to say than what I was actually trying to say. So I failed to communicate. Um, so I was not trying to say that player agency is always an illusion or that it should be. That That's not what I was saying. Yes, players need to have actual agency in the game, at least at times. However, at the end of the day, it is more important, I think, how much agency the players feel like they have as opposed to how much agency they actually have. It's that perception that is really important more so than the actual agency. As long as the players feel like they have agency, they will probably be happy. So I was not suggesting that you never give players agency. What I really meant to suggest is that in those times where you can't give players agency for whatever reason, Um, that you try to disguise it so they don't realize that they have less agency at that time. That's, that's what I was getting at. I wasn't saying don't give them agency. I was saying there are going to be times where for good reasons, you can't give them all the agency they might like, or that you might like them to have. And in those times you can save a lot of headaches for everybody. If you can disguise that in some way, so they don't realize at the time that they maybe have less agency than they normally do. So the three door room is a perfect example of this. And and really quickly, the, the example we were using in the discussion is you're in a dungeon, there are three exits, three doors, and the players choose one. And um, kind of what started this whole thing is the idea of a DM who for whatever reason is winging it and only has an idea for one encounter. So whichever of the three doors the players choose, that's the one that the encounter is behind. Um, So that's kind of what we were talking about. So that's the three door example. And it's a perfect example of of this kind of agency thing. Um, If I only have one idea for what's beyond the room that the players are in, in the dungeon, and I just give them one door, one option, because that's all I've got, then that can seem to them like they have a lack of agency as they really only have two choices. They can continue on or not. However, if I say there are three doors, then it seems like they have a choice because they have three different doors to choose from. Even if secretly, the end result is going to be the same no matter which door they pick. So, so this is what I mean by disguising the lack of agency. So this is a situation where there really isn't any agency, but we're disguising that by presenting the illusion 
of there being more choices than there actually are. Also, um, while we're on this topic, you don't have to give players agency all the time. They don't have to have it every second of every game session. It sounds like some DMs at least think that they do have to do that, and you don't. That every room has to have multiple exits or it's a bad dungeon, um, for example. Um, that's nonsense. If you never give the players agency, yeah, that'd be pretty bad. And probably they wouldn't enjoy it and wouldn't want to play. Um, but they don't have to have agency every second of every game session. It's also important to realize what matters to any given player. Different players care about different things and different care or different players care about agency in regards to different things. Some players care more about agency when it comes to defining their backstory. And they really want a lot of license to be able to do whatever they want to do with their backstory. Some players care more about agency when it comes to, quote, choosing the adventure, deciding what they're going to do for, for the adventure. Honestly, unless you're just a total dick DM who constantly tries to control everything the players do and constantly try to bully them into making the choices you want them to make, player agency probably isn't something you need to worry about too much. In fact, I think most of you probably worry about it more than you need to. I think the key is just go with the flow. Give the players what they want as much as you can when it makes sense, when it's not overbalancing, when it's something that doesn't matter to you much either way as the DM. Then you can dig in your heels about the things that are really important to you. Um, so, you know, an example of this is, you know, I like to give the players agency when it comes to world building. And, and I mentioned this uh, in the other episode that, you know, maybe a, a player wants to go somewhere in my city of Alondria that I've never thought about before. Um, maybe the player wants to go to a seamstress to be measured for a new dress. Um, obviously there are seamstresses in a city the size of Alondria. Um, there's probably quite a few of them. Um, but I haven't really given any thought as to where those seamstresses are, what their shops look like, wh who they are as people, what their prices are like, anything like that. Um, so a player wants to go to a seamstress. I could just, you know, hand wave that and not even do a role-playing encounter and just say, well, tell me what you want to buy from the seamstress and I'll tell you how much gold you, you spend. Um, but if, if I want to have a scene with the seamstress, I could just wing it and, and come up with a seamstress on my own and, and come up with what her shop looks like and what her dresses look like and all that stuff. Or, um, and this is a lot of times what I would do, I could ask the player to do it if they want and say, well, you know, um, yeah, there, there are quite a few seamstresses in the city. Uh, what are you looking for? And w would you like to describe a seamstress shop for me or the seamstress or, or any of those elements? Feel free. Um, I'm giving you license to create this NPC, create her shop, create what she has to sell or not, as long as you're not saying she has magical clothes or something. Um, so, so that's something where I can give a player license and I'm fine with it and, and whatever they choose, as long as it fits the theme of my city and it's not ridiculous, I'm, I'm fine with it. There, there might be other things that I'm more um, adamant about or, or less willing to let players do that kind of thing because I already have a very clear idea in my head of, of the way things are. Um, so by, by giving them license in areas that you can and, and opening that up as much as you can when you can, the, the times when you have to kind of tighten down and be like, no, sorry, this is the way it is, will seem less onerous, if that makes sense. I hope that makes sense. All right. Um, I wanted to give a shout out and thank you to listener DM Sam uh, for pointing out to me that there is some discussion of uh, doing multiple ability checks in the DMG on page 237. Uh, you can check that out. Um, not any hard and fast rules, and they basically said what I said in the episode that it's a judgment call and, you know, just use, 
use logic, you know, it makes sense that certain things you won't be able to try again and certain things you will. Um, something they suggested on there, which let me get that book real quick. Ah, yes. Yeah. So, so those of you familiar with third edition probably remember taking 10 and taking 20 from third edition, which were um, some ways in the system that you could avoid having to roll for things. Um, so we have something kind of like this here. Again, this is on page 237 of the DMG. And um, they say to speed things up, you can assume that a character spending 10 times the normal amount of time needed to complete a task automatically succeeds at that task. However, no amount of repeating the check allows a character to turn an impossible task into a successful one. Again, seems pretty, pretty obvious. So that's the way you can just hand wave things. Instead of just having people roll the D20 30 times until they succeed, you can just say, hey, you know, normally it would take you a minute to pick this lock. If you want to take 10 minutes, you can just do it automatically, assuming that they can succeed at that roll uh, with their bonuses. So yeah, um, so there's a little more guidance in there if you want to check out what they say in the DMG. But again, it's basically what I said in the episode. Sam also suggests that passive checks would be a great topic. He says there are many interesting questions around them, especially given the Dragon Talk episode where Jeremy Crawford states that a character's passive perception acts as a floor for any active perception check. And yeah, I've, I've actually talked about passive checks in depth uh, on the show before. Um, I'm not sure exactly when that was. I, I think it's been more than once, but I'm sure one of them was uh, when we got to that section in either the DMG or the player's handbook, uh, when I did those discussion episodes, but yeah, that, that, uh, thing about the, the perception floor is a really important thing. I wish they would have put it in the book. Um, it's kind of, I won't, I'm not going to say it's obvious, but it, it's logical. It makes sense. It's a natural extrapolation of what they did put in the book, but yeah, Jeremy Crawford did say on Dragon Talk that he thinks of passive perception as a floor, which, which is to say that a a character cannot, um, that that's the lowest they can get on a perception check is their passive perception. Now, I would not do that with every skill, um, but perception is used so much and overused so much, I think, that I think that's a fantastic way to have handle perception. So let's say your character has a plus two bonus to perception. That means they have a passive perception of 12 because the way you figure a passive score is you just take the number 10 and you just add whatever your bonus to that skill is. And that's your passive score. So if you have a plus two to perception, your passive perception is 12. And that means that honestly, that means as a DM, if you have a 12 passive perception, I shouldn't even ask you to roll perception for anything that's DC 12 or less because you would automatically succeed. Now, as a DM, I, I may not remember what everybody's perception is, so I may ask anyway. Um, but if you're a player in my game or in a DM who knows how this rule works game, um, and they ask if you have a passive perception of 12 and they ask you to make a, a perception roll, you can always remind them, hey, my passive perception is 12. Do I need to roll? Because the intent is that you don't need to roll for anything below that 12 because passive perception represents what your character notices just naturally without trying to notice anything. Um, so you anything with a, a difficulty 12 or less to notice is going to be automatically noticed by someone with a passive perception of 12 or higher without a roll. Um, and I, I know some DMs will be resistant to that kind of thing for whatever reason, but honestly you should do it. It speeds up the game a lot. And I mean, perception is the most rolled thing in the game other than attack rolls, I feel like, and anything we can do to, uh, minimize that is, is good and just speeds up gameplay. And it's not interesting anyway. Um, rolling perception checks is seldom interesting, especially when you have a bunch of players rolling them and just one of them needs to make it. Um, use use those passive scores. I often use a passive score with, um, what's it called? Uh, 
I'm blanking, not sense motive. That's what it was in third edition. Uh, into intuition, damn it, insight. <laughs> I I often use a passive insight to to be because it really gives things away to ask someone to make an insight roll to see if they know that an NPC is lying to them. So I just use their passive insight and I'll roll deception for my NPC. And if they beat the PC's passive insight, then the PC doesn't know uh, that they're lying to them. And I don't have to give things away by making a roll. Just like sometimes you don't want to give things away by calling for a perception roll. So you can make a passive version of any skill in the game um, of any, any, role in the game really i mean you could you could have a passive attack role if you wanted to or a passive dexterity check you're just adding whatever the bonus is to 10 i mean you can use it with anything um you may not want to use it with everything but you can um perception passive perception is very very useful like i said passive insight is extremely useful as well and i'm sure there are others so um Definitely, you know, be open to to looking for chances to use that and be open to it when when the players suggest it because they may come up with uh, great ways to use that um, that you hadn't thought of. And it's it still, you know, it still pulls in their stats. It, it just eliminates a die roll. So it speeds things up. And, and especially when it's something that doesn't really matter or, um, yeah, it speeds things up. And the other thing is, is we had a, a question before about, you know, well, what do you do if you have, uh, you know, something you need them to notice with their perception check in order for the uh, story to go on? And I should have thought of it when I was discussing that because the first answer to that question is, well, does anyone have a passive score high enough to notice it? Because then they don't even have to roll and you don't have to worry about what if they don't make the roll because they don't have to roll. So yeah, use those passive checks. They're super, super useful. And something I really love, one of one of the innovations in fifth edition I really love. All right, I got a message from Knox, uh, who says, if I were to build my own world, which I'm starting to heavily consider, what are some of your favorite parts of different settings like Primordia, Forgotten Realms, uh, Willed Amount, and the Greek one, Theros, he forgot the name, uh, or others you've come across that I might build into my game? I doubt I'd build an entire original world. I think I'd really enjoy building a few aspects, but I'd take, um, I'd insert things liberally from other sources. I think others might also enjoy hearing your opinions on that. Yeah, you know, Knox, that is a great way to get into world building. And I, I highly recommend it because, you know, I hear from people a lot that are just blown away with what I've done Um with Primordia, not that it's like awesome or anything, but just that, that I've done it, the amount that I put into it, um, and the amount of stuff I've come up with. And I've had people say, Oh, I could never do that. And a great way, if, if you feel that way, a great way to start is take a setting that you already like, or, or take, take the, the setting that you like the most and modify it. And, um, just go from there and over time, make it more and more your own, give yourself free license to change anything you want. And eventually it, it will become your own. Um, when I first started running D and D, well, actually when I first started, I ran some in Dragonlance, uh, but then I started running in Forgotten Realms and in, in my, uh, second and third edition days and well, yeah, second and third edition days, I I pretty much ran in the realms, but I did kind of my own version of the realms. I, I only focused on certain areas of the realm. So I ran a lot of adventures in and around Waterdeep and um, Silvery Moon were kind of the areas I focused on. And I, I made them my own. I changed all kinds of things. And I would just tell players when a new player joined my game, I would say, look, I'm running into Forgotten Realms, but it's my version of the Forgotten Realms. I've changed a lot of things. I'm continuing to change a lot of things. So please, if you're a fan of the realms and you read the books or whatever, don't assume that anything that you know about the realms is true in this world because it's based on the realms, but I'm I'm not promising to to stick to canon and I'm very much doing my own thing. 
And as time went on, as the years went by and I ran more and more games in that setting, I changed more and more and more and it became less and less like the actual Forgotten Realms. And it wasn't until 5th edition that I decided to start from scratch and and build my own world from the ground up. And and that's Primordia. So, you know, I say I've been running D&D for 29 years. Um, Only the last, you know, five, six years of that have I been working on my own setting um, before that, I was I was using my version of the realms, and a lot of the stuff that I came up with for my version of the realms that was of my creation, I just brought right over the Primordia, um, and and just transplanted it right into Primordia, and I just said it was in Primordia all along. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a great um, gateway to world building is find a setting you like. Um, it might be easier if it's a D and D setting, but it doesn't have to be. Um, and start from there. And and if there's a setting you just like it the way it is, then just use that. Or or if it's something where you're like, well, I, I like most of the things, but there are these few things I really don't like, then change those few things. And yeah, that's that's a great way to get started. And and then it's not so much. And then you can still, especially if you use a D and D setting, you can still use stuff. So when I was running in the Forgotten Realms, you know, back then, this was in the uh, uh, third edition days, they were releasing all kinds of novels in the realms and and all kinds of uh, game products in the realms. So so there was new um, information about the realms coming out all the time. And I was kind of in this kind of sweet position where every time I saw something new about the realms, I could look at it. And if I liked it, I could say, yeah, I'm using that. I'm stealing that. I'm using that in my realms. And if I didn't like it, I'd be like, nope, nope, I'm not doing that. Like for instance, the time of troubles never happened in my forgotten realms. Cause I thought it was dumb. And I'm really glad I went that way. Cause it just got worse. Uh, what they did with it in fourth edition and fifth edition, it just got even stupider in my opinion. Um, so I'm really glad I, I never went there. Um, yeah, that's that's great. Um, thanks for pointing that out, Knox. And and I know I I think I've brought that up on the show before, but I don't think I did the most recent time I was talking about this, and and I really should have. Um, yeah, don't uh, don't overlook you know things that are that are already out there, and and also you know taking elements from here and there and everywhere, which is kind of what I'm doing with uh, Primordia. Um, you know, not all the ideas that Primordia is built on are my ideas. Some of them, um, I've stolen. Um, so, uh, somewhere I had a list. I don't have the list. I I can probably remember it. So there, there are a few major inspirations for Primordia that I take ideas from. One is the world of the Witcher, uh, specifically the Witcher three video game, um, my my uh kind of conception of how adventures are viewed comes partly from that the, the way they're they're feared um some 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 of the ideas of the guild came from the witcher um another big influence that i pull from for primordia is um the wheel of time and more and more i'm i'm pulling from that um as i as i change things uh, another big one is the world of Horizon Zero Dawn. Um, that's actually an influence that has been invisible, <laughs> at least to the players up to this point. It's kind of a secret influence. Um, but but th- that will come into more into play in the next campaign I run, I think. Um, another big one is the world of the book of the new sun by gene wolf um yeah so so those are the 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 four big ones i feel like there there might be something else i'm forgetting um but yeah so so there you know there are like three or four settings that i really like from from different ips um none of them are D &D settings actually and i take bits that I like from each of them and put them together. And, and that's, that's where Primordia came from. And and then there's countless other, you know, influences where I've just taken an idea from here or there 
And, and I could never hope to name all of those, or, or I'm probably not even consciously aware of all of those. But yeah, so so Knox asked, um, what are some aspects I might take from different um, settings? So I'm going to answer this in a way that might not be exactly what Knox was looking for. I, I hope it is, or at least that it's close. But I went through uh, the settings that the Wizards has put out for 5e that I have and flipped through the books again and thought about if you're a world builder or you're going to be a world world builder and you're looking for ideas or things to steal, what are some of my favorite things from some of these books that you might think about? And just here at the top, I might mention this again, but I want to say, I do not think these $50 books are worth buying for a handful of ideas. Um, I am not a fan of how Wizards is putting a little bit of everything in their books to try to make you buy every book instead of having books for players and books for DMs and books for world builders. Um, they're, they're trying to put a little of everything in every book. And for, for you to go and buy a $50 book or even a $30 book, if you get it on Amazon, um, to get just a handful of ideas from is ridiculous to me. Um, if, I, I think some libraries actually get these books. So, so first see if your library has any of these books. Um, if not go to a bookstore, um, something like Barnes and Noble where, where they'll let you sit down and flip through a book and just flip through these books and take some notes, um, an hour, you know, an hour tops and you can get what you need in your notebook and you don't need to buy a $50 book. And, you know, I feel fine doing that because I think this strategy uh, to try to separate us from our money by putting, you know, stringing things out through all these different books. So I have to buy, you know, three $50 books to get what I want is, is ridiculous. I'm not, I'm not in support of that. Um, so again, if, if any of these things sound really cool for you, I am not endorsing these products for these things. Now, you know, if you want to run a game in Eberron, then yeah, go buy the Eberron book. Sure. But don't buy the Eberron book just to learn about the dragon marks is, is what I'm saying. All right. So first off, um, I'm not sure. I think these are in no particular order. <laughs> uh, what, let's start with Wild Amount or Wild Mount. Um, I pronounce it will amount because, you know, will to beast is, is a word that's spelled that way, but I don't know how Matt Mercer pronounces it. He made it up. So his, how he pronounces it is right. But, um, you know, the book I'm talking about, uh, this is a really well-developed setting. I actually personally, in my opinion, this is the best setting book for fifth edition right now is, is Matt Mercer's, uh, uh what is it called? Explorer's Guide to Wild Mount or Wild Mount, however you want to say that. Um, it's a really chunky book. Um, some of them, like the the magic ones, like Theros or Ravnica, are pretty light. Or actually, no, Ravnica is not that bad. It's just Theros. It seems kind of kind of thin. Um, but uh, it's a really well developed setting. We're talking about Wild, wild Mount or Wild Mount right now. Um, if you're looking for a complete setting and Eberron is not your cup of tea, which it's not mine, um, but it's some people's, but if it's not your cup of tea, then I think this is your best option as far as fifth edition settings from wizards goes. Um, I like to focus in this book on where your character came from your homeland, as opposed to your character's race or what we should call species. Um, this makes so much more sense. Um, I like how your homeland influences the languages, you know, not your race. So when you're making a character in, in Wildemount, you choose a homeland, basically which country you came from. And that's what tells you what your starting language is, not what race you are, which makes more sense. That's how it works in the real world. Well, we don't have different species in, in the modern day. Uh, it's been a long time since we've had different species of humanoids on this planet, but if we did, that's the way it would work, right? Um, so yeah, I really like that. Um, I like how your homeland affects the NPC allies and rivals that you might begin play with. And, and that's another really cool thing 
in that book is um, as part of your character creation and fleshing out your background, you usually come up with one or more NPCs who are either allied to you or, or opposed to you, um, which is pretty cool and, and gives the DM even more to work with at the very beginning of the campaign and gives you something more to work with as well as a player. Um, the different regions and nations of the world are, are pretty well detailed, much more so than a lot of the other stuff from Wizards. And some of them are, are pretty unique and original um, to the point that you'll probably either like them or not. Um, but that's that's the risk you run when you go beyond the generic and do something actually original is there's going to be people who like that and people that don't like that. Um, but bravo for not doing the safe thing and giving us just another generic setting. Um, I like the heroic chronicle system in the book. This helps you flesh out your character's backstory even more. Um, I did a whole episode on this, so go check that out if you're interested in that. Uh, but it helps you come up with some NPCs that your character is associated with, um, family members and allies and rivals. And it includes uh, fateful moments that happened in your past, which could result in you getting some kind of benefit like a skill proficiency or a minor magic item, something like that. Really cool stuff. I really love that the book goes into the different types of food that are eaten in the different areas. Um, this is something every setting should do. Super cool. So, yeah. Wild Amount, um, great, great setting. And yeah, you know, if you if you want to check that out just to steal things from it, I, I think there's a lot, a lot you could steal from there. A lot of the history is really cool. A lot of the the peoples are really cool. Um, some of the systems that I mentioned, um, I mean, if there's one of these, that's worth buying, even if you're not going to use the setting, it's probably that one. Uh, next is Ravdika. So this is one of the magic, the gathering settings, which to me feel much less developed than the D and D ones. Um, I hesitate to use the term half-assed, but they definitely seem less developed less um fleshed out like you can't just grab one of these books and run it campaign in the setting you, you've got a lot of work on your hands if you're going to use one of these um so ravnica is coruscant in a D, &D world basically in a nutshell it's it's a planet-wide city in a fantasy setting which to me is immediately stupid and a turn off and i have no interest um so i didn't i didn't care for the setting at all uh, I didn't care for the book much either. Um, that said, uh, I do like the way they handled the rank and renown and the roles within the different guilds. Um, so if you're someone wanting to flesh out um, organizations in your world, um, I wouldn't buy the book for this, but but if you can get a, your hands on a copy to look through it, um, check out what they did there with the different guilds as far as your, your rank and your renown and how you gain rank and renown and what kind of things you get from that and uh, the different roles you can have in the guild. Um, th those are pretty cool. Again, it'd be much better just to make a, a book of DM tools with all this stuff in it instead of having them hidden away in these setting books that most people aren't going to want. But that's Wizards for you. Uh, next up, we have the Eberron book. So this one's a, a fairly complete setting. Um, so if you're in the Eberron stick and you'll know if you are, I think, um, then I'd recommend it. Um, if you're looking for a, a good setting book for your game and you're into the steampunk, magipunk thing, whatever you call Eberron, the Eberron is, um, yeah, it's, it's a really well done book. There's a lot in there. Um, and I think, you know, it can get you started on a campaign in that world and, you know, the nice thing about Eberron is there is a lot more information out there on it other than what's in this book, much of it available for free online. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a great setting to use. And, and like I said, it's a, it's a really well done book, not my cup of tea personally. Uh, but it's nothing against the book or, or anything like that. I just don't get into the, whatever you call that, that magic punk thing. I just don't get into it. Um, the dragon marks are kind of cool as far as systems in the book as a way to give some magic abilities to PCs that might not have them otherwise. Um, I do not like how they 
replace the race or species abilities though. Um, so if I were ever going to use them in any way, shape or form, I would probably have them be in addition to your species abilities. Um, I feel like it's just really awkward, but that's just my opinion. And the uh, group patrons are, are a cool idea. The, the idea being that there's some uh, more powerful, either politically or just powerful, powerful uh, being in, in the world that is your, the patron of your party, of your adventuring group, who uh, sends you on missions, basically. Um, so, so they kind of help you flesh out what the group's patron might be. So that's pretty cool. Again, would be awesome in, in a book of GM tools, but not worth buying a setting book just for that. Um, but yeah, uh, Theros, uh, just started flipping through this. Um, haven't, haven't read it all yet. Um, I really like how Theros uses the gods. Now, Theros is definitely not remotely fleshed out enough to use as a campaign setting as is you, you'll, you'll have a lot of work ahead of you to, to get going with that. Um, but if you're looking for ideas to steal and you're wanting to have a world where the gods are very front and center and very important, and you want the gods to be important to your player characters, um, Theros handles that really well. Um, they use the piety system, which is presented in the DMG. Um, as you do things for uh, your god, you you earn piety. At different levels of piety, you get different abilities. So things like being able to cast a specific spell once per day. At the high levels of piety, you gain a plus two to an ability score. Um, most or all the gods give you two abilities to choose from there for that plus two. So for example, Afara is the god of the polis, um, because Theros is, is based on Greek mythology. Um, so you, for, if you're a worshiper of Afara, uh, you gain piety by defending a city from a major threat, defeating a tyrant who threatens the city's freedom, creating a masterwork like a building or a poem, things like that. You can lose piety by betraying uh, one's trust to to commit acts of corruption or tyranny, destroying a civic institution, or sowing chaos within a city, or willfully breaking just laws for personal gain. So to continue to use the Farah, uh, God of the Polis, uh, as an example here, here are the different um, gifts you would get from her at different levels of piety. So when you have a piety of three or higher, uh, you get the ability to cast comprehend languages with no material component, a number of times equal to your intelligence modifier, minimum of once. And you get those back with a long rest and use intelligence for that. With a piety of 10 or higher, uh, you gain advan advantage on charisma persuasion checks while you are within a city. In addition, you, when you fail an intelligence check or intelligence saving throw, you can re-roll the die and you mustn't use the new roll. And you can't do that again until you do a long rest. With a 25 or higher piety, uh, you can cast Morden Canaan's private sanctum with no material components. And you can do that once per long rest. And then with a piety of 50 or higher, you get to increase either your charisma or intelligence by two and also increase the maximum for that score by two. So yeah, that gives you an idea of what those are like. So they have those for every God, which, which is really cool. Um, this book really does a good job of, you know, it, it would have been great to have this stuff in, in a book about just the gods that you could use in any setting. Again, I, I keep coming back to this, um, but they're not trying to give you value for your money. They're just trying to get your money here. Um, as many times as they can. Um, so it would, it would have been really cool just to have a, a, you know, a GM toolbox and have a section on the gods and have this stuff in there. But uh, alas, we, we didn't get that. Um, also in this book, uh, there are villain and monster ideas for each of the gods. So, so if you want to kind of center an adventure or a campaign around a certain God, um, it gives you suggestions of, um, villains and monsters that that work well with that god um gives you thoughts of using the god as a campaign villain and then each of the gods also has uh some kind of adventuring location associated with them that that's given it also gives you uh some myths for each of the gods which is really awesome 
Um, and it's definitely something kind of inspired me for, for Primordia to do. So, so if you do have your own world of your own creation and you have gods, um, that'd be a great little, uh, fun exercise is to create some myths about each of your gods. And, and I mean, I can't think of a better way to convey to, you know, some information about your God to the players, as opposed to just telling them about the God or giving them a bunch of information is, is to give them a myth or a story involving the God. Pretty cool stuff. Um, and then for each of the gods, they also give some, some adventure ideas. So let's see what they have here for Afara. I'll just keep using her a, as an example. Um, I'm using her because she's kind of the parallel of my goddess, uh, Alondra in, in my world. It's probably my favorite deity. Um, which isn't shocking because she's based on Athena, Athena, who is my favorite Greek deity. So, yeah. Um, let's see. Where are the adventures? Huh. They actually don't have that for her. That's very bizarre. Oh, I see. I think that's an editing thing. Some of the gods, they have a section about adventures for that god. And then some of them, they have a section about a cam campaign for the god. So I think that's an editing thing. They should have made them all the same. Um, so let's see. Yeah, actually, this isn't, I'm, I'm not going to read this, but but they basically give you some ideas about what a campaign kind of centering around Afara would be. They suggest it would probably be a city-based campaign. Um, yeah, but but I really like, they they really go into kind of what the God's agenda is, what they're trying to accomplish in the world, what some of their adversaries are and yeah, just much, much better developed information on the gods. And I remember seeing before in, in D and D as far as things that the DM can actually use and not just a lot of useless information. So um, yeah, I really like how they handled the gods would have much rather seen that in its own book of, of DM stuff, or maybe just a book about gods and, cleric stuff or something as opposed to like stuck in this setting that let's face it hardly anyone is going to buy because unless you play magic you don't even know what theros is and i don't know how big the uh crossing of the venn diagram between magic players and and D, &D players really is but i don't feel like it's that big i mean if you're talking people who have played one or the other sure you know but People who are actively playing magic and actively playing D and D, I don't know. Maybe they're. I'm sure they're out there, but I don't feel like they're the majority by any stretch. So, so this, I don't know. Th this thing of like trying to pour magic settings into D and D just mystifies me. Other than it's low hanging fruit for them that they can just crank out a fifty dollar book without having to put much into it. But other than that, I don't really understand the purpose. Um. I, I would have much rather seen them take the time and effort they put into Theros and Ravnica. And they did some other ones that they just did little PDFs for and like come up with a new unique setting. But that would involve doing something new and fifth edition wizards. They don't seem big on doing new things. They are all about rehashing old stuff. All right. So, so there are the ones for 5e, uh, Wildemount, Ravnica, Eberron, Theros. Um, like I said, there there are a couple of the other uh, magic settings that they just did PDFs for that you can get for free, um, but they're even less developed than Theros or Ravnica is. So, I mean, you can mine those for some ideas maybe, but I wasn't really impressed or inspired by anything in those. But feel free to check them out. Um, so last, I thought I would talk about a non-D&D setting. Because honestly, and I think I said this in the last episode, um, if you're looking for inspiration for your D&D &D game, I think the best place to go is non-D&D &D stuff. Um, I mean, I don't want to sound like an elitist, but the best writers out there are out there writing for themselves. They're not writing for wizards. Um, and so, I mean, learn from the masters, right? I mean... <laughs> You know, right? If I'm going to, I don't know, if if I'm going to learn a web design, you know, do I want to learn from someone who took web design in high school? 
do I want to learn, learn from someone with a bachelor's in it or an associate's in it? Or do I want to learn with, from someone with a master's in it or a PhD, right? I, I want the highest I can get, right? So the same thing with world building, you know, if you're looking for ideas for a great setting, I mean, sure, you can get some ideas from Dragonlance or Forgotten Realms or whatever, but you could get much better ideas from a good fantasy series. Um, yeah, so I thought I would talk about my favorite setting, the setting of the Wheel of Time, um, which is so funny. I, I saw a thing on Tor because the Wheel of Time is published by Tor on their site a while ago. Um, wondering what they should call the world of the Wheel of Time. And I was a little amazed and flabbergasted by that because the world of the Wheel of Time already has a name. And anyone who was writing that article should have known that. Um, but I can't tell you what the name of the world is because it's a spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll just call it the world of the Wheel of Time. So things I like about this setting that I plan to steal for Primordia in some way, shape, or form, and, and you might want to too. Um, I like that there's only one magic. Different people in the world use the magic in diff very different ways. They have very different ideas about it. But there's only one magic. It only comes from one source. There's no divine magic and arcane magic and druid magic and warlock magic and all these different magics from all these different places. No, one magic. Yes, different people understand it in very different ways. They use it in very different ways. And those ways are not always compatible. But at the end of the day, there is only one magic and it comes from the same place, no matter who's using it. I love that. There isn't really a religion in the world. Um, there is a philosophy. Now I would, now some people might say there is religion. Um, and there is the children of the light, which is a religious order, but the, most of the people of the world, at least what we see of it, there, there isn't a religion. Instead, there's a philosophy that people believe in, but there's not a religion. And, and there's a distinct difference between a philosophy and a religion. I love that the magic has nothing to do with the philosophy. Um, I love that the one group of religious zealots that do exist in the world, they're called the children of the light. Um, and like D&D's paladins, I, I think are based on the, the Knights of the Crusades, at least somewhat. And, and I think more are based on the uh, Knights of the Arthurian legends. Um, but the children of the light, the, this religious order of knights, they don't use the magic at all. And in fact, they think it's evil. Um, think, you know, Spanish Inquisition. Like, that's what these guys are like. You know, if you use the magic, you're the you're a witch and you use it for evil. You are evil. That's it. That's all there is to it. Um, I also love that these are very much not the good guys in the story. They're very much villains in the story, these religious zealots. I love that. <laughs> I just, I can't even express how much I love that. That A, there's hardly any religion and the the one group of people that are religious are the bad guys and everybody else um, stays as far away from them as possible. Um, great stuff. I I like the flexibility of the magic system. It, at least if you approached it from a R RPG perspective, like the Wheel of Time RPG did, which was based on a uh, third edition uh, D20 system uh, that D&D used, um, it uses the Vancean kind of magic with spell slots and all of that um, that D&D does, but it at least makes it feel less restrictive. And, and, you know, I mean, that's kind of fitting a round peg in a square hole. Um, there, there's nothing about the way the magic is used in the stories that remotely makes me think that Vancey and magic would be a good fit for it, but they, they had to work with what they had. Um, but, but they were in third edition doing something very similar with their spell casting to what we do in fifth edition, where you can cast spells at different levels. Um, it worked a little differently, um, but, but it was kind of a precursor to what we have now. Um, it, it has really cool systems like over channeling, linking and on girls, um, which are different ways that you can increase the power of the magic you cast. 
Um, the idea in the Wheel of Time is when you use magic, you are channeling this energy through your body. So you are pulling magical energy from the source, where it comes from, and directing it through your body, harnessing it, shaping it, manipulating it. And so there's this very real sense of there's a limit to how much of this power you can handle. It's like, I, I think of electricity, right? Like you can touch your tongue to the poles of a nine volt battery and it's going to sting, but it's not going to hurt you. I mean, maybe if you left it there for a long time, it probably would eventually chemically burn your tongue, but it's not going to hurt you at least initially. Um, it's a lot different than getting struck by lightning or touching a high tension power line. Right. Um, so, so one of those you can handle safely, the other you can't. And the, the same thing with the one power, which is the magic of the wheel of time. So over channeling is going beyond what you can handle safely. You're, you're pushing the limits and, um, from, a, from a game mechanics point of view, this allows you to either cast a spell when you don't have any slots left or cast a spell at a higher level than the slot you're using to cast it. Um, but there are very real risks involved. Um, in the stories, the risks were you could either burn yourself out, which means you will never be able to do magic again, or you could actually kill yourself if this went badly. Um, so it's not something to be done lightning lightly, but it is an option that is there. And in a lot of ways, from a game perspective, it's giving a player just enough rope to hang themselves with, which I love. I love that kind of stuff. You know, it's like, Hey, you can do this really risky thing. And the, the drawbacks are, are quite dire. Um, but if you succeed, you could do something really cool that you normally wouldn't be able to do. Um, players love that kind of stuff. And I, as a DM love that kind of stuff because whichever way it goes, it'll be fun. Um, linking is a way of doing the same thing. Uh, only different casters are able to link together. Uh, so from, from like a gameplay perspective, let's say you have three spell casters in your party, your, your three casters could link together. And then one of them could cast magic more powerfully than they normally could because they're using the power from the other two. But now those other two can't use magic at all while they're, they're linked. Um, so again, there's a trade-off really cool. And then Angriol were just, uh, basically magic items that did this for you that let you cast more powerful spells than you normally could. Um, so those are, those are really cool mechanics that I would definitely think about using. Um, another thing I love in the wheel of time um, that I've never seen a D and D setting manage nearly as well is the different nations and cultures. And these are the most developed and realized and memorable, I should add of any fantasy setting I've read or encountered. I have some read some that were maybe more developed as in they were more complicated, but they weren't more memorable. In fact, they were forgettable because they were so complicated, but in, at least in my experience and I haven't read everything, but of all the fantasy I've read, um, these cultures are the most unique and well-developed and realized and described and memorable to where I could sit here right now and name seven, eight, nine, ten, however many you want, different cultures in the world. I could tell you a bit about what kind of clothes they wear, what kind of food they eat, what their weapons look like, what their armor looks like, what some of their customs are, what maybe some of their turns of phrase are, all from memory. Um, that's how good it is. But but just some of the things that are included for, for these cultures, to give you an idea, uh, things like clothing fashions for men and women. People in the different countries dress very differently. Uh, foods eaten and prepared in the different countries. Uh, the relationships among the peasants, merchants, and nobles, the different classes of society, those are very different in uh, different countries. Uh, relationships between men and women and the gender roles themselves differ from country to country relationships, or I just started to say the same thing again. Uh, one of the cultures, the IEL actually don't use the Eskimo kinship system 
like pretty much every other fantasy culture I've ever seen does. And pretty much like um, here in the United States, we use Eskimo kinship system. Uh, all the European nations, to my knowledge, do. I mean, um, you have to go beyond, I think, the first world to get to cultures that don't use the Eskimo kinship system. They're still out there. Um, but the IEL do, do not, they use their own kinship system, which is dis- different. And it's a, uh, I believe it, I, I would argue it's a matrilineal system. Um, and it's super cool. I love it. It's one of my favorite, they're one of my favorite cultures in, in the story. And, and one of the reasons is because it's not the traditional Eskimo kinship system that we're all used to. Uh, different cultures have different profanity and slang terms that they use. Uh, the kind of the, the big bad evil thing in the world is called the dark one. The different cultures all have different names for the dark one. Um, different countries have different opinions about the magic and the people who use it, who are called Aes Sedai. Um, it go, it goes the gamut from there are countries where Aes Sedai are hated, feared, hunted down and killed. And there are countries where, um, they're revered. Uh, of course, they have different exports, things like tobacco, tobacco, wool, dyes, silk, iron, etc. Uh, they all speak the same language, which is actually kind of nice, um, especially from a game perspective. Um, you don't have all these different languages to wor- worry about. Um, but each country has their own distinct accent and dialect so that it's obvious, you know, to a person in the world when they're talking from some- to someone from a different country. Uh, different countries have different armor and weapons that they use. Uh, also, each culture in many ways takes elements from a few different cultures throughout history and kind of mashes them together. So if you have the knowledge to identify those cultures, what those cultures are, then you can extrapolate even further once you understand which elements are being taken from which cultures to make which uh, country in the wheel of time. So you can strap, extrapolate even beyond what the author gives you if you want to go that deep, which why not? When, you, when you're dealing with a, with a world so well-developed, why would you not go that deep? And it's the best presentation I've seen in fantasy of the wide disparity of knowledge between ignorant folk who live and die in a very small area, which is most people in the world, especially the peasants, versus those who see more of the world than where they were born. This is especially fun because many of the main characters in the story begin as total bumpkins and you get to learn about the world with them as they see more of it and learn more about the way things really are outside of their tiny little village. And you also get to see how much of what they believe in the beginning turns out to be total bullshit. And that's actually a lot of fun. You also, once you learn the truth and you know the way things really are, get to see how twisted it becomes among the ignorant people and you get to hear ignorant people say really ignorant things and realize how ignorant they really are, where in the beginning of the first book, you didn't realize they were ignorant at all. And that's really cool too. So I love the setting and a lot of my revisions that I'm currently doing of Primordia are trying to bring more of what I love about the Wheel of Time in the Primordia and um, hacking D&D to pieces <laughs> to make it work. And I'm having fun with that. All right. So so that was what I wanted to get through today. Um, it, it's kind of funny because this started out as just some some responses is some feedback I gotten and some things I wanted to go over again and, and better explain what I, what I was trying to say or, or give another perspective or whatever, but ended up uh, kind of having a theme, which I didn't even really realize until I started re- recording this episode, how much we kept hitting on kind of some of the same themes. So that's pretty cool. Um, wasn't exactly by design or, or if it was, it was, it was subconscious on my, my part. But thank you to everyone who uh, commented and asked questions and and gave feedback on the recent episodes. Um, You guys helped make this uh, episode possible. Thank you. Thank you for uh, 
sharing your thoughts and your questions. All right. Well, that about wraps it up for episode 283 of Dungeon Master's Journey, the finale of season 14. Um, Hopefully we'll be back uh, soon for season 15. But just in case this is the last episode, I want to thank all of you for your support. I really appreciate it. Thank you for downloading the show and listening to it. Really appreciate it. Thanks for sharing it with your friends. Thanks for your questions and your feedback and your words of encouragement. Um, I really appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. And and I really, really hope that um, enough people will sign up and subscribe that, that we can keep this going. Um, but uh, unfortunately, I just kind of got to that, that point of no return where, um, you know, this is this is the way it has to go forward. And, and hopefully we can go forward. But if not... Um, you know, we've, we've done 283 episodes. I feel like we've at least touched on any possible topic regarding running RPGs that you could think of. Um, if, if there hasn't been at least an entire episode on it, we've at least touched on it here and there. Um, so yeah, you know, if we come back for season 15, it'll be fun, uh, finding some new things to talk about. But I have ideas. Like, like I said, there's a lot of world building stuff I could talk about. Um, I have th- thoughts on on Descent into Avernus I could give you and how our campaign with that went. Um, I could share some more thoughts on the new uh, Theros book. And yeah, I mean, just keep exploring dungeon mastering and, and storytelling together. So I want to thank all the patrons again. Thank you for your support. I really appreciate it all patrons past, present, and hopefully future. And thank you to everyone who who's donated on the website, who's bought a t-shirt or a coffee mug or bought one of my D and D supplements. Um, I really, really appreciate it. Really appreciate you guys and all the support through the years. And, you know, all, all of you hanging, hanging out since the GM intrusions days, you know, thanks for, for sticking with me and coming along to the new show. And, I I can't believe it's been five and a half years. I keep doing the math again because I feel like it hasn't been that long. But I've been doing the show for over five and a half years. It's insane. Maybe we can do it for another five and a half years. I hope so. So, yeah. Um, I think it's about the time to sign off. Episode 283. Um, if you want to shoot me an email, email me at dungeonmastersjourney at gmail.com. I've also got voicemail at 951-GMJ-LEX-1. That's 951-465-5391. And finally, um, head on over to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash Studios, or you can follow the link in the show notes to my Patreon page. If you sign up for $2 a month or more, you will be, quote, a subscriber, and you'll get the new episodes And again, um, if we hit the threshold for four episodes a month before uh, September, I will start making new episodes as soon as we hit that threshold. Otherwise, as long as we hit the threshold for one episode a month, I will uh, start in September with season 15. And, and, you know, I am not... Right now, my, my, my goal is four episodes a month. I don't really want to do one or two episodes a month. So we'll do that for, I don't know, a few months or so, uh, just to give people time to get on board. But, but if we don't get, um, to the four episode threshold by then, then, then I will probably end the show at that point. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I feel pretty good about this. I, I have a feeling we'll be back. Um, I, I have a feeling there's enough out you of you out there that can spare two bones a month that, uh, we'll be back. But if not, you know, keep gaming, keep dungeon mastering, keep world building and just have fun with it. You know, I, I feel like we've done all these episodes, we've had all these conversations and and really at the end of the day, you know, <laughs> what's the saying? Go follow your bliss. <laughs> it's so lame, but it's kind of true. I mean, at the end of the day, do what's fun, do what's fun for you, do what's fun for your players. And as long as 
everyone's having fun, you're, you're doing it right. And really that's, that's long and short of it. And, and all this stuff we talk about is just ways to get to that point. Um, but yeah, you know, at the, at the end of the day, it's a hobby. It's a game. We do this for fun. Most of us don't get paid to do it. Um, I don't know if any of us get paid to do it, but I certainly don't. Um, we do it for fun. So just have fun and, uh, be creative and enjoy being creative. Enjoy the, I don't know, just the fun of being able to create your own world, your own adventures, and then watch your players go through them. It's good times. All right. So I hope that you have a chance to play some D&D this week. I hope you have a chance to run some D&D. Hopefully, I will be back soon with another episode of Dungeon Master's Journey. But whether or not that happens, please, 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 game on and on and on. This has been a Starwalker Studios production, your source for quality gaming and hobby podcasts. This episode's music, courtesy of Cloudwalker, Transboy, Renfield, Stanko, and Ish. See the show notes for more details at starwalkerstudios.com slash Game Master's Journey.